Excellent. Great. I don't know. I, I named the, the message today Fatal Attraction. Fatal Attraction. And um, we're going to talk about how, you know, some people are crazy about Jesus and how crazy they are about the Word of God at some point in their lives. But comes a point, as I was mentioning just earlier today, that, that we stop. Why? Because we have fatal attractions that distract us from going all in for God. You know, the, the, the problem is, is that, you know, we have, I tell all the single people this, you know, unless you, you become complete in Christ, you can never have a relationship that you should have because you've got to learn to be complete in Him first. Because once you're complete in Him, then He'll complete you, right? So that's the reason that we got to seek to be complete in Him. And, and, and what happens, we get distracted. I mean, I've seen people fall and get away from the Lord. Why? As I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, is because they, uh, they, uh, they meet Jesus. Uh, Jesus is real to them, but they have needs. And because they have needs, then they, go, they, 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 they distract themselves from their relationship with Christ. And they go after their needs, and they say, Lord Jesus, wait here. I'm going to go and get myself a husband. I'm going to go and get myself a wife. I'm going to get myself what I need. And you can't do that. you got to learn to be complete in Him in order for you to have everything. That's, a, that's the reason the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. Amen? How many, how many of you have experienced the adding of the Lord unto you? I mean, uh, the Lord is always adding. So, uh, um, so, you know, we left it off. You know, we've been talking about the, the, the hearing heart. We've been talking about the heart of man and, and all of that. So today I'm going to talk about fatal attraction by how we can hearten our hearts. How many know that we can hearten our hearts? And I'm sure that people here and people there, we all experience people that have that have known God at some point in their life, but they have hardened their hearts. They're no longer on fire for God. They no longer love God with all of their hearts. Their hearts are hardened. They have become callous. They have become worldly. They have embraced the things of this world. And one of them, uh, the story that I want to bring uh, to you today, is the story of King Herod. Okay, King Herod. Um, and we're going to read a portion of Mark chapter uh, 6. Uh, if you have that, I'm going to be reading from the Amplified Bible. So uh, Mark chapter 6, six uh, verses 7 on. And he says, And he called the twelve disciples and began to send them out as his special messengers two by two and gave them authority and power over the unclean spirits. And he told them to take nothing for the journey except a mere walking stick. Imagine that. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals. And he told them not to wear two eunuchs. And he told them, whatever you go into a house, stay there until you leave that town. Any place that does not welcome you, or listen to you, when you leave there, shake the dust off the soles of your feet as a testimony against them, breaking all ties with them because they rejected my message. Verse 12. So they went out and preached that men should repent. How many know that's a good message? So they, they all went out and preached that, that man should repent, that is to think differently, recognize sin, turn away from it, and live change lives. Verse 13, and they were casting out many demons and were anointing with oil many who were sick and healing them. Oh, how many know that those days are coming? Amen. Verse 14, King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name and reputation have become well known 
and people were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others were saying, he is Elijah. And others were saying, it is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. Verse 16. But when Herod heard of it, he kept saying, John, whom I beheaded, has risen from the dead. Verse 17. For Herod himself has sent guards and had John arrested and shackled in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his half-brother, Philip, because he, Herod, had married her. Verse 18. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful under Mosaic law for you to have your brother's wife. Verse 19, Herodias had a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but he could not. So this is a beautiful story uh, of King Herod. I mean, he's still alive, so he was alive in the, in the, in the time of uh, John the Baptist, when John the Baptist came out of the wilderness and he was preaching. And now he's still alive when Jesus is here, but he's the one that killed John the Baptist. And you all know the story that the woman says, you know, what do you want? I'll give you half of the kingdom. And, she, and, and he says, give me John the Baptist's head on a platter. How many remember that story? Right? So everybody, you know, everybody went to hear. I mean, now let's go back now to John the Baptist for a moment. And then we'll come back to this at the end. Is, you know, everybody went to hear this preacher named John. You know, he came out of the wilderness, you know, probably didn't go to a hair salon. He probably had lots of hair. He probably stunk, right? He was uh, probably looked like a homeless person, maybe. Uh, they didn't brush his teeth. Maybe his teeth are falling off or whatever. And he was eating bugs in the desert, right? But he had something very unusual that we long for. He had God with him. He had the word of the Lord with him. And the Lord was preparing him so for so many years in the wilderness. And now he's coming to the open. So he went up in the desert, uh, went up in the mountain, and they start preaching the gospel. They start preaching repentance. They start preaching about one that is coming after him and all of that. So King Herod heard about John the Baptist. Okay? So this is, this is the connection between Mark 6 to, the, to King Herod and uh, John the Baptist with King Herod. Because King Herod heard about John the Baptist, and guess what? He went to hear him. He says, you know, who is this guy that is preaching over there? He says, you know, I heard a lot of good things about him. Because, you know, the Bible says that King Herod was gladly hearing John the Baptist. So he liked John the Baptist, right? So he will go and listen to John the Baptist, and, the, and you know, and, and uh, King Herod will not come by himself. Uh, and the Bible doesn't say that he came under disguise. So he will probably come with all his bodyguards, all the horses and everything like that. Let's go and hear John the Baptist. And here he was probably, you know, just listening to John the Baptist and says, yes, yes, yes. That's what we need. You know, he spoke about the hypocrisy uh, uh, that was going in town, just like the hypocrisy that is going in churches and in this nation here in Canada. So he was, you know, John the Baptist was just exposing everything. And as a king, he liked it. He liked that somebody was speaking the truth because he knew that a lot of religious people, they will, uh, you know, go to church, go to their synagogues, go to their things, but they will live a different life. So he knew the hypocrisy in, 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 the, in the synagogues, in, this, in, in, the, in the believer's life, right? So, I mean, he liked it. He liked it, and he will go back, and he will go back and hear him. And, you know, the message was what? A message of repentance. Turn from God, and this and that. Return to the Lord, and all of that. So then, uh, one day, John the Baptist looks at him, okay, and rebukes him. And then that's where we read over here. So he says that John the Baptist said to him, he says, the women that you're with and the relationship that you're with 
is bad. You must repent from it. And I'm sure that King Herod at that time, he said, Amen, preacher brother. <laughs> Amen, you know. I mean, I like that preaching, right? And, uh, you know, he wasn't looking at the sin. He was, you know, he, the Bible says that he, he was really glad to hear John the Baptist. You know, how many, how many people today, you know, they are so glad to hear truth, but they're still living for the devil. Come on. They will say amen to the church. They will say amen, brother. Yeah, preach it. You know, I had that over the years over here in, uh, 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 as I preached the word of God. And I was talking to somebody in Toronto. And I, and I said to her, uh, and I said, um, I said, sister, I said, I said, man, I said, you know, I'm in Halifax. They're preaching a, a hard message. And, uh, and she goes, she said, Pastor John, I says, you, you were always preaching a hard message. I said, no, not as hard as the one over there. I said, that one, you know, I mean, nobody likes me anymore there. <laughs> so so she's, she says, you were always a preacher of truth, you know. And, uh, but I was not really living the good life of the truth. Then God had to do a work in my life and bring me over here to bring, to bring the truth of God. But, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, that they say, amen, you know, uh, uh, we love the, the, the message of repentance. We love the message of John the Baptist, you know, and, and King Herod was one of them. He loved the message of, uh, of him, but when he was rebuked by, uh, by John the Baptist, I'm sure he even clapped. He says, yes, brother, you know, that, that's a good one, you know. Like, uh. But then he went home and he had to think about this because the man of God, he had a high respect for John the Baptist. You know, he, he respected him because he, he liked him, right? And even before he killed him, you know, that he didn't want to kill him, but he promised uh, the, the women, you know. So anyway, so, you know, John the Baptist knew and uh, King Herod knew that the woman that he was with was not good for him at all. She was a murderer. She was bad. She was this and that. That was his fatal attraction. Right? That was his, his fatal attraction that he now he had to make a choice. He says, well, you know, if I like John the Baptist, I love the message that he preached about repentance and all of that. But he says, I'm in this mess over here. He had to make a decision, and he made the wrong decision. He stayed with a woman, right? And that's where a lot of people in the world today are. They love truth, but they're not willing to give up something in their lives, right? So, you know, my question to everybody is always, you know, what is your fatal attraction? What is the thing that's keeping you from being all in for God? What is the thing that is keeping you? Because here's a guy, King Herod is a perfect sample of believers today. I mean, they will hear truth and they will jump and they will, they will shout, Yes, preacher, brother, come on, brother, come on, this and that. But yet, they're still falling for some fatal attraction outside of the church outside of when they when they leave the the um the um uh the crowds and that so you know he had you know when people hear a lot of hypocrisy they are glad to hear truth i remember you know when i first came over here and i start preaching truth man a lot of people were glad and i'll tell you a little insight for those that were not in, uh, with me at that time at the beginning when i came to the province nathan I came and I start. God began to expose the pulpits, the hypocrisy in the pulpits, and I and I say, "Oh my God, no prayer, no uh, no repentance message, nothing like that." And man, the, we had a large crowd. We had a good crowd. We had uh, prayer meetings every every Friday from seven p.m. until midnight, five hours. And in the spring meetings, I will be back and forth, back and forth, and I will even I wouldn't even go to the bathroom. I mean, there were powerful prayer meetings, and people were there that wanted to hear the truth, and they were shouting, "Yes, brother John, we are in a mess. Yes, I speak to these pastors, you know." And at one point on the radio, I say, "You know, these pastors are like mafia and all of that." And people just loved it that somebody had the courage to stand up against the system that is destroying us, right? Amen. But then after a little while, the Lord changed it. 
the Lord now came to the pews to live a holy life. Without holiness, nobody will see the Lord. And all of that, hey, 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 wait a minute. The same reaction that King Herod had. You know, he wanted to hear the truth about uh, the hypocrisy in the churches. He wanted to hear the truth about the hypocrisy in the business. He wanted to hear the truth that John the Baptist and they should all repent from the hypocrisy that is in the business and the government and all of these things. But then the Lord changed the message and now he went to him and he, and he says, you know, the, the relationship that you're in is not good. And that's what I believe happened in, my, in the ministry that God gave me over here. I began to go after the pew. And that's when the pews began to disappear. Because, you see, we rather follow Christ from a distance. It happened in the Bible. They follow Christ from a distance. Or they have a relationship with the Lord through a window okay this is your life right here and we have a relationship through a window and we we talk to him every day we pray every day but we're afraid to ask him in right that's why you know that's why jesus in uh, uh, in um, revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says i'm knocking why because we don't let him in you know and that's not a message for the lost that's a message for the church that have kicked them out, right? We use that for, uh, for uh, leading somebody to Jesus, but, you know, three, uh, Revelation 3.20, he wants to come back into the church. The church has kicked them out. The church is having a window relationship with him because, you know, we're afraid to let him in. We're afraid to open up the door of our lives and say, Lord, come in, come in, you know, and then, and then we stand and we stand there and we say, oh, and, he's, and we say, hey, I guess you want to you wanna change the floor in here. And then Jesus says to us, you know, I am so happy that you let me in. And then we get nervous and convicted. And this, I guess you want to change those phony uh, flowers over here. And I, want, I guess you want to put uh, real flowers over here. And then Jesus says, I am so happy that, that you... Uh, that you invited me in. I'm so happy that you let me in. You see, we always think that Jesus is going to come and start destroying everything in our lives and all of that. No, he's a gentleman. Say gentleman. He's a gentleman. The devil is, a, is the one that pushes himself in. But God, no, he comes as a gentleman inside. And, he, and, the, and then we get convicted and this and that. And, and, and then, you know, the person might say, Lord, my whole life is a mess. My whole life is a mess, Lord. There is so many things I have to change in my life. And then Jesus, this is my Jesus. Then Jesus says, you know what? Hold my hand. And let's do one at a time. Let's clean up one thing at a time. First things first. You see, and that's the reason that a lot of people, they, they, they don't want Jesus to come in. Because they think that Jesus is going to come in and just destroy everything in their lives when he's there to help us. He sent the comforter to be with us. He sent the comforter to heal us, to restore us, to revive us, to bring us to our rightful place in God. But, but then we, 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 we tend to fight that which is good for us. Amen? And that's, and that's the, the battle that King Herod uh, encounter. That's a battle that most of people today in the body of Christ, or I, I shouldn't say the body of Christ, in churches today are encountering. And that is, you know, uh, I mean, the Word of God has not changed. The message is still the same. The same message that John the Baptist preached and Jesus preached and Peter preached, still the same today. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven has come unto you. We pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I mean, we have to realize that, right? So uh, anyway, but, God, but, but then we harden our hearts. You know, the Bible says that our hearts are desperately wicked. Right? That's the reason that we got to come to Jesus. And we got to say, Lord Jesus, destroy the, the heart of rock. Destroy that and give me a heart of flesh. 
Give me a heart after you, not a heart that will hearten uh, uh, um, uh, and disobey you and all of that. But, Lord, I want a soft heart. I want an obedient heart. I want a hearing heart. I want all of that. So, you know, so anyway, so that's a, that's a wonderful story. And then we're going to read a couple of scriptures in a moment. And um, so, you know, he loved the preaching. But then he came to his fatal attraction and he was not willing to. To give it up. That then after that he participated in killing the very person that he liked. Oh, hallelujah. So Jesus, I mean, John told him to repent. Herod knew this woman is a bad woman, a murderous woman. She was a snake. He would have loved to repent. Listen to this. He was torn. And if you, and if you, if you read the scripture, he was torn. He didn't want to kill him. He wanted to probably repent, but he knew the cost of it, as a lot of so-called Christians are. There is a cost to it. How can I give this up? I mean, you know, I've I, I, you know, seen a, a couples going to run relationships, and they, when, when they go into run relationships, they cut off every, everybody around them that they care about, that people care about them. Why? Because they choose the fatal attraction over the holiness of God. You see, you see, because they have never come into being complete in Christ, then the moment that this guy or this girl comes, hey, I'll grab him, and, uh, and uh, I don't care. I love Jesus. I like, John, I like John the Baptist. I like the preaching of the Word of God. But... I need a husband. I need a wife. I need this fatal attraction. I don't care if he's sold out to God. I don't care if he's sold out to whoever. I need companion. I am lonely. I need companion. So, you know, then what happens, we compromise our life. We, we water down the message. And what happens, the moment that we do that, when the moment that we go into a fatal attraction, then what happens, the devil comes in, blinds you of the truth, makes you think that you are in the truth. That's the reason that the Bible says that there is a way that seems right unto men, but the end thereof is death. So what happens when you, when you go after your fatal attraction and you grab that above God and above his perfect will for our lives, so the devil comes and deceives us. That's the reason that Paul said to the church, and Paul is speaking today loud and clear to Canada and to us. Who in the world has bewitched you? So that means that we, have, we are grabbing the things of the world. We are grabbing these fatal attractions. And then the enemy, we're inviting the devil in. We invited, you know, the Bible says, neither give place to the devil. Why? Because the moment that you give place to the devil, the devil will take it. The moment that you open the door of your life to the enemy, he'll come in. And guess what? One has to move out. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, darkness and light cannot dwell in us. Right? If you choose a fatal attraction. But a lot of people, you know, and I, I, I met people in, in, in the ministry, through the ministry, you know, that the, the, once they grab the fatal attraction and they grab their sin and whatever that is, they hold hands. Oh, thank you, Lord, for your blessing. Yeah, really. You know, so they're in the fatal attraction mode. And, they're, and they believe that Jesus is coming. And they put in the cars, oh, I'm blessed by the Lord. I don't know what Lord that is. But when we embrace fatal attractions over Jesus, we are sending a clear message to heaven. Jesus is not enough for me. I have to go after my fatal attractions just like King Herod did and just like many Christians today. That's why I call them the unbelieving believers. You know, they tell you that they believe, but yet they're not practicing what they believe. They're not, uh, they're not taking action on their beliefs. Amen? And uh, so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, it says this, No, you not... That the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Be not deceived. Listen. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, man with man, woman with women, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Are you hearing? This is the word of God. Verse 10. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners should inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 11. And such were some of you, but now you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, hallelujah. I mean, you know, that's the reason that we must be born again, as, I, as we mentioned last week. You know, John chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Jesus answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to understand, there are requirements to go to heaven, right? <laughs> and that is not going into the cookie jar, right? <laughs> you cannot go to the fatal attraction cookie jar. You cannot go to that sin in that cookie jar. Because that sin, the Bible says, will separate you from God. Amen? God is a holy God. He is worthy to be praised. Amen? We praise the beauty of His holiness. We, we abide in Him and He abides in us. And the reason that we ought to obey Him is because, you know, and you say, why these harsh words about uh, uh, in the Bible when Jesus, God, is a good God? You know, why? Because He knows the outcome of the fatal attraction. He knows the outcome when we go and grab something from the cookie jar. Look what happened to, uh, to Adam and Eve. You know, they had a cookie jar. The devil came and he says, oh, the Lord told you not to touch that tree. The Lord told you not to go after the fatal attraction. The Lord told you not to go into the cookie jar. He says, because if you go to the cookie jar, you will know good for me. Well, you will have, you will have powers. I said, go to the cookie jar. That's not going to happen. I says, you know, he says that you should surely die. So, you know, they went. You know, here's a tree over here, you know. So they went. The women went. Then the men went. And they grabbed the fruit. Listen, very important. They grabbed the fruit. She took from the tree her fatal attraction, her disobedience to God. And then she must have said to herself, Nathan, I'm not dead. God says that I should surely die. But I'm not dead. Adam, here, we're not dead. Now we're going to have more knowledge. We're going to know good from evil. We're going to know a lot of good things. And I say, oh, by the way, <laughs> Adam, you're naked. She didn't know that he was naked until she bit that fruit. He says, we're naked. <laughs> right? And I say, here, you're not going to die. The death was not a physical death that God was talking about. It was talking about a spiritual death, a separation from the Holy One. And that's when the partition between man and God was built. Amen? And that's the reason that Jesus had to come and die on the cross for the sins of the world, rise from the dead to break the partition between us and God. But what happens, we accept God, but then fatal's attraction build a wall once again, and we crucify Christ once again. So we go back to the basics or where we were, as we spoke last week. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, Daryl, a lot of people say, that will never happen to me. That will never happen. That was me uh, many years ago. You know, I was, I was invisible, uh, invincible. You know, I mean, John, hey, John, you know, uh, there's no devil that is going to get me. You know, we used to fast, pray, call on God, and this and that. And I remember, you know, one day we were doing a fast and prayer retreat at this church. I was leading it. And then uh, we went right into the spirit. 
and we were praying, interceding. And then I saw this big devil, so tall, over the city of Toronto. And when I saw that big devil, he turned around and looked at me. And when he looked at me, he was not scared of me. And that's when <laughs> he got me. He burst the balloon. Why? Because I was becoming cocky. I was becoming invincible. I have Jesus with me. You know, we used to sing a song, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. Right? Me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. And that's what I thought. You know, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going. And, you know, we saw miracles. We saw people cast. We cast out devils. We healed the sick. We, we prayed. And, 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 and we were a church of prayer and power and all of these things. But Johnny had a big chip on his shoulder. And he said, it will never happen to me. Well, let's read on, uh, on uh, Romans chapter 1. Verse 18, ah, come on, let's see if he says, for, I'm closing with this. For God does not overlook sin, and the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, against unrighteousness of men, who in their wickedness suppress the stifle the truth and, and, and drown the truth. Verse 19, Because that which is known about God is evident within them, in their inner consciousness, for God made it evident to them. Verse 20, for ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, all his creation, the wonderful things that he has made, So that they who fail to believe and trust in him, listen, are without excuse and without offense. For even though they knew God, say knew God. Come on. Even though they knew God. Come on. They knew God. It will never happen to you. It will never happen to you. It will not happen to you if you abide in him and he abides in you. It will not happen to you if you're dead to self and Christ lives within you. It, it will not happen to you if, you if you can truly say with your life and your lips, for me to live a Christ and to die is gain. You know, it will not happen to you because a person that can claim those sayings knows the dangers of being out of place with God. He says, even though they knew God, nobody escapes this. Come on. Come on. So he says, uh, verse, let me read from. So, for ever since the creation of the world, the, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature has been clearly seen, being understood through his workmanship, all his creation, the wonderful things that he has made, so that they who fail to believe and trust in him are without excuse and without defense. For even though they knew God as the creator, they did not honor him as God or give thanks for his wondrous creation. On the contrary, they became worthless. How many know that a lot of churches today are useless? They get together and they sing, and that said, they're not reaching the laws, they're not praying, they're not working together. There, there is a lot of, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, jealousy, envy. There is a lot of anger. There is a lot of resentment against other churches and stuff like that. And we're not working together. Why? Because that's a sign that the devil has come in. And it says, on the contrary, they became worthless in their thinking. Come on. Worthless In their thinking. Jesus did not save us. Jesus did not rise from the dead. For us to go to mass. Or for us to go to a service on Sundays. Or whatever we meet. And have an hour and, or two hours even. Of a service. And that's all we do. And all we have. If that all we do and all we have. I mean we are worthless. Right? Come on. This is the word of God. I'm just preaching the word of God. Amen. And, uh, you know, he says, worthless in their thinking, godless with pointless reasonings, 
and silly speculations. And their foolish heart was darkening. Okay? So they're, they're, they, they knew God, but their foolish heart was darkening. Claiming to be wise. How many know that a lot of people today, they claim to be wise? You know, show me the fruits of your repentance. You know, I remember preachers that have, that have repented. They say, oh, I repent from, from raising a lot of money and stealing a lot of money from people. It was wonderful a few years ago when somebody came on television. I did that. So I, I, I say, well, that's good, but that's half. Now let me look at the fruits of that preacher's repentance. Is he going to give back money to people? Right? And you never heard of that again. So you see, when we repent, we got to have fruits. When we repent of something, we got to have fruit. If Herod would have repented, he would have to what? Get rid of the wife, right? Get rid of that woman that he stole from, from, uh, from his uh, half-brother or whatever. He would have repented from his uh, fatal attraction. He would have repented from, from his sin. But on the contrary, he didn't, right? So he, he, oh, their foolish heart was darkening. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Oh, my God. We are only wise in the Lord. The Bible says that the wisdom of this world is the foolishness of God. But the wisdom of God is far greater. Oh, hallelujah. I thank God that he chose me. I thank God that he chose the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. I'm, I'm, I thank God that he chose the weak things of this world to confound the mighty. Oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory be to God. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory and majesty and excellence of the immortal God for an image worthless idols in the shape of immortal men and birds and four-footed animals and reptiles. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them over. Oh. You want to hear truth? That when you are embracing, Nathan, listen, when you embrace your fatal attraction and you don't want to let it go, the Bible says in the Old Testament, it says, there comes a point that God will let you have what you want. Oh, hallelujah. And that is a bad thing to have, to have when the Lord lets go and he doesn't convict you anymore. And he says, you want that? When you know that it's bad for you, go and get it. Go. It's yours. So there is a point that God will give them over in the lusts of their own hearts. To what? To sexual impurity. So that their bodies will be dishonor among them. Abandoning them to the degrading power of sin. Because by choice, that was their choice, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. You know, he gave them over to a depraved mind. Useless. Worthless. You know, if you, if you go to Toronto, if you go to Toronto, you'll see a lot of people that knew God and they're walking in, in the city of Toronto talking to themselves. Talking, talking to themselves about God, about this and that. Why? Because they have gone back and forth so many times that their mind became depraved. They crucify Christ over and over and over again. But God had no choice to separate himself from that. You know, that's why he says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't crucify Christ all over again. Right? But these people have gone back and forth over and over. They say, oh, I can go and grab the... For se September will be the month of the world. I'll be worldly. And then October, I'll be holy. 
And December, well, Christmas, I got to spend some, I got to go to the office party with uh, alcohol and everything, so I got to let loose, I got to go and get drunk and be part of the crowd. I'll tell them about Jesus. So December will be the worldly month. Then January, repentance, New Year's resolution, repent, repent. And that's how the church lives. How do you know that, Brother John? Just look at Canada. Where in the world are the Elijahs? Where, where are the true preachers? Where are the John the Baptists? Where are the Pauls? Where are the Philips? Where are, where are, where are they? Amen? And you're saying there's none? Oh, I'm sure there is. But, you know, I'm looking at the fruit of our repentance. And that is where we are today. And I close with this. Listen, this is, this is terrible. Or maybe I'll finish reading that scripture. And in the same way, the men turn away from the natural function of the woman, were consumed with the desire to work one another, men with men committing shameful acts, and in return receiving in their own bodies the inedible and appropriate penalty for their wrongdoings. Verse 28, and since they did not fit to acknowledge God or considering him worth knowing, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do things who were, which are improper and repulsive until they were filled with every kind of unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, and mean spiritness. They are gossips and so on. And I close with this. So remember, Herod was the one that killed John the Baptist, right? So now, Herod is about to kill Jesus. And to participate in that, he hears about Jesus. He hears, and, and he says, he must be John the Baptist coming out of the, bed, out of the dead. He said, I killed John the Baptist, and he's come alive again. And he, he's operating as Jesus now. And then, well, and then, you know, as you know, Jesus went up to Pilate, right? And then Pilate washed his hands from Jesus, and he went to where? He went to Herod. And when he went to Herod, listen, he went to Herod and said, Jesus, you are John the Baptist. Tell me, you are John the Baptist, come from the dead. And Jesus is looking at him, listen. And the Bible says, and we read it, Jesus did not respond. Their time, I'll close with this, a time comes, and you can read that in, in uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 8 to 12. That Jesus did not reply to Herod. The time, there comes a time when Jesus doesn't talk to us anymore. Herod, he knew, Herod feared John the Baptist, but he chose a woman over the gospel. Now he's afraid that I am the, the Baptist coming from the dead. He's just fearful that I'm going to come and uh, expose his sin. And then he says, tell me, you are John the Baptist. Tell me, tell me, you are John the Baptist. And Jesus looked at him and didn't talk to him. There are times a, con a, t a time come when God will stop talking. The question is, has God stopped talking to a lot of churches today? I believe he has. So they're running on an empty tank. They're running in what we call the reserve. You know, when the, the, the needle says empty, but you still have maybe a few kilometers. They're running on the reserve. And that's where we are. Fatal attraction. Herod harden his heart to the truth. The thing is, is are we hardening our hearts to the truth of the word of God? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We praise you.
We thank you for this story because King Herod is not different than believers today. They love the preaching of John the Baptist. They love the preaching of repentance. But yet they live like devils during the week. And he hardened his heart. He chose his fatal attraction over God. And then when Jesus came to the picture, oh, hallelujah, he was afraid that he would be John the Baptist when again. The Lord, you stop talking to him. You did not reply to his request. Father God, right now I pray that every person that hears this message and is embracing fatal attractions, wrong relationships, they have chose wrong relationships over you just like Herod did. And they're in sin and they know it, but they want to cover it because they hold hands and they pray in Jesus' name. Judgment has come, Father. Judgment. Judgment from you has come. And no greater judgment than when God speaks no more. And that's where we are, Father God. I pray, Father, that our hearts will not be harmed, but God, that we will repent of our ways and we will show fruits of our repentance. That we will look at our lives two years ago comparing to today. Are we the same or are we worse than two years ago? Are we the same or worse than a year ago? If we are, something is wrong. We're not plugged in to the vine. We're not plugged in to you, O oh God. So forgive us, O oh God, we pray. And we pray it as you have taught us how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Wherefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in things of heaven, earth, and under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, our Father. One thought before we end. One thought. Over the years, I've seen a lot of people reject truth. I've seen a lot of people call me names and everything like that. And my heart breaks. You know why? Because they're doing a lot worse than when I met them before. They chose the fatal attractions. They chose the other side. And my heart breaks. They're still the same as they were years ago. And that my heart breaks. They have embraced things that they shouldn't. And my heart breaks. So the sign that you are in God is that your life today is better than a year ago, way better than two years ago, and way, way better than three years ago. For if your life is the same today or worse, you're missing something. God bless you.